Hi, really nice to be here. Really nice to see you, Kirsten. Kristen. Oh my God, I do that all the time. <laughs> really nice to be a guest on your podcast, Kristen. Oh, thank you. I'm grateful that you were able to join us. We're going to be speaking today about the importance of the breath and how we use the breath to heal. But I would like to begin with how you came to, onto that journey. Like, what was your impetus for starting your yoga journey? My yoga journey I started uh, mostly from uh, fitness, from the fitness side of it, from the asana aspect of it, mm. and that is because I was a very regular body balance uh, attendant. So that is a yoga to music type of program. Mm. And um, I became very familiar with the poses and the asanas and coordinating breath to movement. And it was very, very nice to be invited to a vinyasa class one day because the body balance class was fully booked in the gym. Mm. And I actually enjoyed that more because there was no music, because all I could hear was my own breathing. Mm. And there was this sensation of achievement at the end of the class. So it gave me great satisfaction to take part. Um, but what I found out over the years was that I was not always able to practice those strong practices mm. and um, had to turn to more spiritual more static, shall we say, mm -hmm. practices. They're not static. Pranayama yeah. is not static, but I'm just saying practices that are not as physical uh, in order to maintain a good physical and overall health. Mm -hmm. As uh, I am a chronically ill person, I was diagnosed with systemic lupus in 2004. So my health had a lot of ups and downs. And it was those gentler practices in the downs of mm. my health that supported me to get back to the ups of the practice afterwards and even to running and cycling and other, you know, things that we do to keep our body fit and healthy. So my journey started from the fitness perspective. When I was back to good health, cause mm -hmm my systemic lupus caused kidney failure and eventually a transplant. Mm. After my transplant, I um, decided that I wanted to just use, just show other people the tools that I had used mm -hmm. to manage and decided to go and, you know, get a, uh, 200 hour teacher training, a bit of a varied journey there. Um, <clears throat> I went, uh, I started with kids yoga and then I continued on with uh, more therapeutic adapted yoga. I did a 200 hour in adapted yoga and then I went on to do a 300 hour again adapted yoga. So <clears throat> my training was mostly adapted, restorative and but my practice was a lot more energetic than that, shall we say, mm -hmm. other than when I discovered restorative yoga in 2017, um, which was awesome, actually. That's when I realized that it was really, really important to just rest, that mm -hmm. rest was significantly more powerful. So I left the active parts for teaching, especially mm -hmm. the kids, definitely active for the kids. Takes a lot and of energy. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of running and dancing and vinyasas and sun salutations. It's nice, uh, energetic, definitely mm -hmm. energetic. So I left the energetic parts for the teaching and I kept the restorative breathing and yin kind of practices for myself. Mm -hmm. I utilize them quite a lot to just rest and restore my body, even if it was 10 minutes, uh, in order to carry on with the day. Because what happens if you're chronically ill the fatigue may get to you before the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So it could be because of stress. It could be because you're busy. It could be because of a wide variety of reasons. And therefore having um, a restful break in the middle of the day helped me complete my tasks, deliver my yoga classes and, and, and be of service to everybody that I was there. So 
it was in 2017 also that I was invited to teach chair yoga for the local mm. MS group. So that's where the journey started in terms of me finding really great satisfaction in mm. teaching yoga. I had finally arrived to a place where I saw a lot of, I'm trying to find the words, <clears throat> I saw meaning in what I was doing. There were people in front of me that were going to utilize the yoga I was teaching in exactly mm -hmm. the same ways as I was using it. So chair yoga became this gateway to, uh, I don't know, teaching more meaningfully for me yeah. and I guess for them as well. That's so that's really the whole journey. Myself from a fitness perspective, mm -hmm. my health journey in terms of managing the disease and remaining fit and healthy yeah. to return to normal activities. And then once I started, once I got my qualifications and I started mm -hmm. teaching myself and um, utilizing more still and restorative practices for me to manage mm -hmm. my regular life. I'd like to define a few things because I feel like some of our listeners aren't so familiar with lupus as I wasn't until we spoke previous to this chat. Um, so can you describe in the best way you can what lupus is and how it affects you? It can be very unique. It's an autoimmune condition which uh, attacks. Uh, what that means is that your own immune body turn immune system turns against your own body. Mm -hmm. And that can cause chronic inflammation and damage in your body. So in systemic lupus, it could be any major organ. It could be mm. kidneys. It could be the heart, um, the brain, not so much, but mm. it can be, it could be the skin. And there is also blood disorders associated with, um, with systemic lupus. In my case, unfortunately in 2004, it attacked my lungs first. Mm. So I had a major episode of pain and what is known as shrinking lung syndrome. So therefore I couldn't take a full breath in because it was too painful. A, the diaphragm was affected. It took a year to recover from that. And then as I was recovering from that and I was in and out of hospital, they also mm. realized that my kidney function had dropped and therefore there are blood indicators that show that. So when they do a blood test, it's easy to tell. And therefore mm -hmm. discovered after a kidney biopsy that I had damage in the kidney and that it was because of lupus, because what happens with the antibodies that are being created because they think your own body is um, the enemy, they create these deposits that then go and are dumped in other odd places in the body. And it could be your joints, it could be your kidneys, it could be your lungs, and that causes chronic inflammation. Mm. And, <clears throat> and basically they found those double stranded DNA antibodies on the kidneys and they, I got diagnosed with uh, lupus nephritis as they call it. Mm -hmm. And, the rest is kind of history because in my particular case, and I guess anyone who may have kidney involvement with their systemic lupus, mm -hmm. it means that they are very heavily immunosuppressed. Therefore, all the other typical sim symptoms that systemic lupus patients have, like headaches, fatigue, and <clears throat> general malice, were not as obvious unless I was really, really unwell. And then what the doctors used to notice was a kidney function drop before all the other symptoms came along. Okay. So, yeah, so that is my experience of it. I was, I didn't experience that much pain after mm -hmm. the first year. The first year was definitely painful, definitely trying. Um, but then after the diagnosis, which is in fact quite quick, I received lots of chemotherapy and immunosuppressants and I had to deal with drug side effects in, mm. instead. So people who have systemic lupus could just be managing their disease with milder medication and not be immunosuppressed, or they could have major organ involvement and need heavy immunosuppressants 
So then they are also dealing with drug side effects. Um, but you're just grateful for the treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, again, because if I didn't have that treatment, I would have probably ended up on dialysis a lot mm -hmm. quicker than I did. It took 10 years to end up on dialysis. And then a few months later, I got a call and I got a kidney. So it was a miracle. Oh I don't know, winning the, ro winning the lottery, yeah. whatever you want to call it. So yeah, <clears throat> that's my journey with lupus. Of course, I still have it. Mm -hmm. But what happens with those that have had a transplant is not that they are cured, is that they are even more immunosuppressed than they were before. Because yeah. so. the body is trying <laughs> to take in this foreign object, which is the kidney, yeah. is what you're describing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you have to stop your body from attacking what you have there. Right. And that's why they require, in the kidneys in particular, they will find in here in the UK, they will find the person who is the best match rather than the person who needs it the most. Hmm. Uh, needs it, needing the most is a factor in their selection on who gets huh. the kidney that is up, shall we say, uh, because there's a great demand for it. But if you are a perfect match or if you're hmm. only one antibody out or two antibodies out, you probably will get a call. Because what happens is that there is two kidneys, you only receive one. Mm -hmm. So two people benefit from it. And people who have diabetes will probably be further up on the list because they also get the pancreas with it. Mm -hmm. So pancreas and kidney go in one and then the kidney goes in the other person. The liver goes into two different people. The lungs go in one, the heart goes in another person. Uh, and then you have eyes and skin depending. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, what I'm trying to say here that if you're not an organ donor, please be a lot of people, like at least five people benefit from mm -hmm. your um, from your gift. I was about to highlight that. Um, I was like, yes, this has everything to do with organ donation. Yeah, it is. And, and it is so vital. Um, we can't take it with us, unfortunately. <laughs> And they can change the lives of at least five people out there. Uh, a big advocate for that. But at mm -hmm. the same time, I, I know how it changed my life. One of the biggest things, I know that we're not talking about transplant uh, as such, but one of the biggest things I noticed was I was cold and achy all mm -hmm. the time before the transplant. Mm -hmm. So soon after I woke up from surgery, I'm like, ah, oh, this is hot. What is going on? <laughs> It's actually typical hospital temperature, roasting You're right. hot. <laughs> That's so, yeah. I'm happy was, you highlighted just... that. But I'd like to go oh. back um, to the parallels between the inflammation you experienced in your lungs and what some people are experiencing now during the coronavirus pandemic. I, I for one, when I had coronavirus, that was the symptom I felt the most. And thank goodness I was vaccinated. I didn't get it that bad. I felt it mostly in my lungs, and that's what caused me so much fatigue, so much grief as an emotion, and so much anxiety post um, the virus. So can you, I know you haven't, and thank the goddess that you haven't had coronavirus, but um, if you could speak to what happens when you ha are suppressed in the lungs or inflamed in the lungs from your experience. Yeah, when I had the, the, the shrinking lung syndrome, which is when the whole uh, thing started, um, and I will tell you exactly what helped, in fact, at that time. Uh, there was a lot of pain because there was inflammation inside the rib cage. So the lungs would actually touch the rib cage and then the diaphragm wasn't strong enough to kind of expand the lungs. So I couldn't get air in either uh, at the time. So I'm guessing if there is tissue damage in the lungs and if there is any sort of inflammation there, then there would also be associated pain that then makes your shoulders and your back and generally that band across your rib cage underneath your chest kind of tight and sore. So coughing can be really painful, breathing in, laughing, sneezing, definitely not an option. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, you are stuck with breathing on the upper chest only. Therefore, 
the little vagus nerve and the little, you know, the solar plexus, all the things that you have at that front part of your, or the neurological system, things you have sitting at the front of your chest that Mm -hmm. can benefit by simply breathing and massaging because Mm -hmm. you're breathing are not benefiting anymore. And you are stuck in this fight or flight state. And therefore you feel like you are fearful, anxious, Mm -hmm. depressed, uh, down, I guess is the word. Uh, Your sleep may also be compromised because when you are going to lay down and sleep, I mean, laying down was a challenge in itself. Mm. I had to be reclined uh, uh, in that year when I was recovering from shrinking lung syndrome. But Uh, when you get to the deeper part of your breathing as you are falling asleep, there is a good chance you will wake up because it hurts. So you end up with this, and then you're back into shallow breathing again. So your sleeping is never right either. Uh, When you, you may be experiencing pain across the chest and you cannot take deep breaths in. So going back to the bit where I kind of recovered. Uh, The doctors were very impressed that I recovered within the year of diagnosis and that the capacity was back to normal after a year. They thought it was going to take a little bit longer than that. So another Mm -hmm. year is what they were thinking. Um, I took up hill walking. I'm in Scotland, so there's lots of hills here where I am. And that ability to breathe in deeply and out in the fresh air, deep breaths in and out, And also the exercise, I guess, part of it really, really helped. So I knew at the time, and it was a little bit a mental thing, I guess, that although there was pain, there was not going to be any damage from that pain. I was reassured there was not going to be any damage. So you have to, in a way, maybe move past the pain, breathe in deeply and out, and slowly things start having a more positive effect you start feeling better the inflammation starts calming down and the other thing that I really did was keeping my body warm I know that's not yoga but uh, keeping my body warm can relax the muscles and it Mm. can get you in a nice relaxation state and you can feel at ease to breathe and uh, and then benefit from other more uh, shall we say, advanced uh, breathing practices. Mm. So that's what I did. I made sure that I was in a place where I had to breathe in a lot to bring in the energy and to bring in the breath into my belly and to other parts of the body below (laughs) the rib cage because it was painful. Uh, And pain management is very, very important in any of those cases pain in itself can really compromise healing. Uh, So if you're given medication, don't, and it's not addictive, don't be shy to take it. It it will help you uh, recover quicker. Um, So I wasn't shy, and and that's how I recovered. The hot compresses helped Mm because I was relaxing and I was breathing. The pain relief helped, and I could go to sleep and then when I was in a good fit enough state, I would just get out on a hill, fresh air, mm-hmm. a bit of effort to go up. We have small hills that you can go up in an hour. Skolti around the corner in Bankery is great. Uh, and we have big hills. Choose. We take, don't have that in place. Miami. <laughs> <laughs> what we ended up doing, in fact, going on holiday to Corsica that year, oh, yeah. where it was nice, nice and hot. And they have some little hills there as well uh, that you can go and climb up little mountains and watch the spectacular view in the hot Mediterranean sunshine. So that was nice. (laughs) Sorry, happy memories from a difficult time are also great. Definitely. Uh, But yes, uh, focus on the inhalation in order to surpass your... And sometimes managing pain in itself requires a lot of mindfulness and focus and persistence 
the other thing that I was going to say in terms of recovery for people maybe that are struggling from COVID or other respiratory conditions is to develop an attitude of perseverance and resilience it is hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel when you are unwell. It is really, really hard to keep going. But at the same time, it is okay to stay asleep all day. So get the systems you have supporting you around you and accept that they need to be there for you to recover. Because part of recovery may have to do with the guilt that your husband is looking after the kids mm. all the time or that your mum had to you know take time off work to come and look mm -hmm. after you whatever you have going on ask for help and if you receive it do not feel guilty that it's there <clears throat> because you need it and it'll make the recovery quicker and everybody will be happier when you're well <laughs> mm -hmm, um, and the other thing is get into a routine of doing things so that there is a purpose to get out of bed even for a little bit mm -hmm. and then get back and get out of bed go for a walk maybe do a little bit of yoga if you can and then go back even if it is just the case of getting up and doing a downward dog by your kitchen bench and stretching out and having mm -hmm. a cup of tea, sitting out, breathe in and out, watch your favorite program and go back to bed. And that's your routine. That's mm -hmm. fine. At the time I added more. So I would wake up, hot drink, hot compress, movement, either a walk or some other form of movement. And then it was really nice to slowly, slowly add things on. Mm -hmm. uh, longer walks, longer movement, longer... <clears throat> you know things doing things around the house longer and uh, you know take your time in your recovery is what I'm trying to say take your time in your recovery and allow for others to look after you it's hard and a lot of meditation is required too uh, in order to feel like there is a meaning in those meaningless tasks you're doing in the day like making your cup of tea and watching your favorite tv program <laughs> yeah i think what you're speaking to is some discipline some inner resilience and yeah. the ability and some kind of radical acceptance right of where you are because i know i like i recently injured my hip and all i would for the first two weeks all i wanted to do was fix it and fix it in my mind was do like all the things right Oh, I could fix it by doing this yoga oh i could fix it by trying this oh, i could fix it with pilates i could fix it with this and what my body was screaming was like, please stop, please just sit down. <laughs> you know? yeah. And that took so yeah. much acceptance, even on that level of like not chronic illness. And I, I am not sick anymore, but just being able to like, okay, Kristen, all you can do is sit here, maybe meditate. Maybe you could have some tea. Maybe you could go for a walk. There is plenty of residual guilt that is still present, <laughs> I must admit. <laughs> from being chronically ill and having people look after me for the 10 years it took until I had my transplant and the ups and downs of that. But, um, yeah, let go. There is a radical acceptance there that is required to get rid of that, uh, of those scales, like the fish scales of guilt <laughs> from your mind and, and you know when you start accepting this then you will see meaning in you being able to make your own cup of tea in you being able to make your own dinner over time um even if you can't pick up the kids from school that day because at the back of your mind is i want to go there i want to see the christmas show i missed the christmas show in 2014 when i had my transplant mm -hmm. i couldn't mix with as I say, the great unwashed. Uh, I couldn't mix yeah. with the public. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't mix with the public. So therefore, I wasn't allowed to go uh, with the, uh, with the, at the school to watch the Christmas show that year. 
and there's guilt associated with that because he yeah. was looking for me you know he says mommy's not coming mm. I'm like no she can't she will be unwell so accept yourself and accept that what you're doing has a meaning to others so yeah radical acceptance indeed I'd like to speak also to, we're talking about chronic illness and we're talking about illness in general or viral illnesses, infections. I'd like you to speak on the importance of being able to breathe deeply and to take things slowly for even folks that otherwise are, are well. Yeah, it, it has to happen. As I said earlier, the inhalation has qualities of a inviting prana in, of higher energy, of energizing, energizing qualities into our body, inviting prana in. So what I used to do to maximize the effect was also stand at the same time <laughs> when I would take a big stretch in and breathe and it could be painful yeah. as well. But just invite breath in and take a pause to see the effect that it has on you. And as I was saying earlier, once you see that it has a positive effect, even if there's a tiny bit of pain in there, keep going and that will have then a domino effect on the nervous system. On You have to have a big inhalation to exhale slowly as well. Then start learning to control the exhalation, which will promote relaxation, and uh, a, a lagana, as we say, a more <clears throat> relaxing quality to it. And the two work very well together. So bringing the energy in can also have a positive impact on the relaxation part of it. So, and also it makes you feel happy and mm -hmm. energized. And, I'd like and, to and, try and that's that. it. I'd like to you try see, that and then experiment. it doesn't have to happen forcefully. You can mm -hmm. do it very much in passive positions. I think that's the whole point of mm -hmm. restorative yoga, where even a rolled up blanket at the bottom of the rib cage, laying on top of it with the arms and just laying on the floor, a very simple restorative pose, can create this open space for us to invite that prana in. Mm. And then that slows the whole breathing process down so it wouldn't just be the inhalation that is benefiting but also the exhalation it has a knock-on effect on the overall well-being mm. so even if we don't feel it happening and we are in a passive position supta barakanasana is a good one even without props bring the arms overhead and that'll do it laying mm. down um you know there are passive positions that will invite energy in and help you feel better overall so yeah it doesn't have to be active it doesn't mm. have to be a specific pranayama practice either as you read as you probably realized already i already said a lot about just breathing you know mm. and controlling and bringing stuff in so just be aware that even passive positions that invite more breath in, gentle back bends, arms overhead, big stretching out and radiating in all corners of the body can be incredibly beneficial also without specific pranayama. I would like to try that experiment. If it's okay with you, I'd like you to lead us in one deep breath. One deep breath. <clears throat> so I want us to really... Uh, sit up tall wherever you are, especially if you're seated on a chair, even if you are driving in your car. Oh, well, I'm not sure about that. Keep the eyes <laughs> open. <laughs> Roll the shoulders back and down and lift the chest. Uh, yeah, make sure there's nothing there. Even weight across your butt so you feel kind of even and balanced on your seat and seated up. And provided you can open your arms wide, you're going to take roll the shoulders back and down, bring the elbows back, take a breath in, and then gently, if you can, uh, you can just hug yourself and exhale out and even round your spine to push the breath out, and then go again. And then this one will feel even bigger. 
and then out again hug yourself gentle touch is really good for your nervous system maybe even massage your hands all the way down to your wrists and your hands and then go last time that feels even better <laughs> and then exhale down again gentle touch a bit of a cat and cow i guess basically <laughs> is what we're doing here seated with the gentle touch which then helps us regulate our breathing and I mean, if you notice now and sit and reflect on this practice, you may discover that you're breathing a little bit slower, a little bit deeper, a little bit more effortlessly. And the gentle touch has qualities of grounding and centering mm -hmm. and a bit of self-love associated with this too. And it's nice to combine those with a little bit of intentional pranayama to just feel better. I really enjoyed that. I think it's something that can be done throughout the day, especially if you're sitting at a desk to take the time out. Maybe if you're sitting all day, you would stand up and try to like open your arms up like a cactus Absolutely. and breathe in and then close and hug yourself as you breathe out just a couple of times to reframe and ground because I don't think anything is more ungrounding than having to sit at a computer all day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. And you are plugged in. It's like, I love some of the art that you see around where your mm. face is sucked into your mobile phone or your computer. I yeah. love those pieces of art, but they are so realistic and they are very ungrounding. Mm. Technology is a, has lots of Vata qualities, lots of mm. air, lots of out there. So there is associated, as they call it in Ayurveda, derangement mm. with these you know with these things so it unbalances our mind and with that goes all sorts of other ungrounding unbalanced uh, uh, practices and effects and it, i think i notice that the most if you've ever tried to take a phone or a tablet away from a child and they just explode that is horrifying to me i'm always like <laughs> what what is even if it's an educational program they're messing with i'm like what is in this thing what is this thing causing in their little sugar. brain i was about to say cocaine but no it's sugar yeah <laughs> well, it's i don't sugar. know what it, it is it really looks like a like you're coming off some kind of very heavy drug when you kind of pry these things away from children and that i mean just watching it i have to wonder like why is this thing so ungrounding and if it's that ungrounding in children, it it's ungrounding for us too. Yeah. And, you know, I am speaking very honestly and maybe politically incorrect at times, but mm -hmm. that's what happens. It's this addiction. There is mm -hmm. an addiction mm -hmm. behavior related to electronic devices when it comes to children. Absolutely agree. Well, I'd love for our listeners to continue this conversation with you. So if it's all right, please share where they may find you um, online. Uh, their website is the best place to land, as always, uvayoga.co.uk, uh, Y-U-V-A, yoga, all one word, .co.uk. And uh, I am at Yuva Yoga UK again, all one word, uh, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So my handle is the same and I'm most actually active. I'm most active on Instagram. <laughs> I was devastated the other day when my account was restricted, but <laughs> past that, but back. I'm most active on Instagram and I really love Instagram. So please come and say hello at Yuva Yoga UK. Mm -hmm. And you, your book is Chair Yoga. My okay. book, the Chair Yoga Handbook, is mm -hmm. available on Amazon, the Chair Yoga Handbook. It'll turn up, hopefully, mm -hmm. <laughs> after a short <laughs> search. But the Chair Yoga Handbook is available on, on Amazon, either as a printed book or an ebook. Although, if you do intend to buy the ebook, may I suggest you come on my website and do mm -hmm. it because um, it comes in all the different formats and I give you a lot more extra on my website than the Kindle version which uh, Amazon provides, but you know, people mm -hmm. are there, however they find you, they find you. And I'm grateful for that alone. Uh, so yes, uh, please, please, please uh, come and say hello. And uh, yeah, please buy my book. <laughs> yeah. I'm grateful for this offering. I don't know if you know this, but um, when I moved back to Miami, I took both my grandmother's um, 
well, I guess I was out of work at the time, so I had the time to take both of my grandmothers to chair yoga, and it was such a beautiful experience. So I want to comment that even if you're not a yoga teacher, but you just want to be more involved or understand your older relatives or friends, I think it's a great, a great experience. Yeah, I also feel that it is a completely different practice. Um, what you may find when you get the book is that you realize that there is a different, sorry, I need to turn a light on here. It's getting dark in the UK. I there thought it was my That's computer. I'm better. like, where are you? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm just going to turn a little bit. Oh, that's not a good place for the phone. But there we go. That's a little bit better. So there is a much um, deeper functional element to the practice, especially when you're practicing with older adults and seniors. Um, we are moving dynamically. And in that, you can, I'll go closer to the window, actually, because I know the video will be not quite right. Sorry about that, everybody, if you're watching Sorry. on YouTube. <laughs> Hi, I can see me now. Um, but uh, all the other rooms are taken in my house, actually. But beyond that, if you do take the book, you may realize that there is a different way of practicing. It isn't just about replicating poses. It is about mobilization, functional movement incorporating movements that stimulate the right and left side of the brain, therefore promoting acuity, better acuity of the mind, which is, you know, vital at any age anyway. And of course, we are helping people through repetition to discover ways to manage whether it is old age, we are all getting older, or whether it is chronic conditions, pain, or, you know, general day-to-day -day things that may challenge them and mobility things that may challenge them. So it's a little bit different than simply replicating poses mm -hmm. uh, from a book to fit the chair. There is a greater purpose than simply the poses and the asana. That's a great point because I'd like, I'll, I'll double down on that because I am a person that was born with scoliosis and I'm hypermobile. So I tend to overextend and hurt myself all the time. So chair yoga allows me to find more structure in my practice because you really have to be methodical about where your body is and you have the support of a chair. I guess, I guess we could compare it to like even like a Pilates machine, right? A reformer where you're yeah. kind of your body has that structure you move within these contained limits. almost contained exactly so i think that's really helped me personally i am hypermobile too um i won't show the people how far my fingers go back <laughs> <laughs> do it <laughs> it just happens um and it's been a great help in many poses um mm. Four bends being one of them and overextending the knees yeah. and not actually benefiting from them because I'm overextending the knees. Um, or another pose would be uh, a triangle and extended angle where mm. it is a side bend, but I wasn't really benefiting from the side bend because I was really hanging on my joints on the legs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I can I can keep talking about how many poses I have benefited from as a hypermobile person practicing them on the chair. So, uh, yeah, there's so much you can do if you're hypermobile with the chair and there is more function in the pose in itself. Forget about function and uh, daily movement because, yes, that can be easily the case. Mm -hmm. It's also function within the pose. What do you want to achieve? and the chair can help you with that also agreed i hope we've proved that chair yoga is for everyone um, i will put your website and all the details in the show notes so folks can find you i want to thank you so much maria for coming i've truly enjoyed our conversation and i know we've enlightened listeners and viewers alike and my apologies if i can be a little bit too honest no why that's <laughs> what this is for no, I I am so grateful for your honor uh, for your honesty and I'm privileged to have you. Yeah. Thank you for listening everybody. Of course. Thank you.